Welcome, everyone. On today's episode, we have Dee Cook. I am so excited to have her, and we're going to learn a little bit more about her background in a second. But I wanted to give you a little bit of the context of why we're chatting about what we're chatting about today, which is a lot of having to do with the existential crisis that AI might create in our uh, society, in our commerce, and in our national security. And we're going to cover a whole bunch of topics. So I don't want to break that uh, that preview for a second. But let's go straight into where we met. So as many of you that are followers of the podcast probably know, there was the AI summit in the UK last year. And during that AI summit, there was a couple of fringe conversations that happened. And we met at one of those panels and it was really interesting uncovering some of the challenges that as a society we have when it comes to the inclusion of AI. And I really loved your points, Dee, on this. And that's one of these things where I want to sort of unpack some of the issues that you brought up in that panel, but obviously more as well. And so to introduce her a little bit better, I want to share some of the great stuff she's working on and she has done and the role she has. First of all, and I'm going to read this, she's the International Security Program Fellow at the CSIC. Now, for those of you that are not familiar with the organization, for 50 years, the Center for Strategic and International Studies has developed practical solutions to the world's greatest challenges. Today's global landscape presents strategic opportunities that will define our future. And it's no surprise, therefore, that she's in charge of and focusing on the AI part of that. In addition to that role, she's also a research affiliate at the Center of the Study for Existential Risk at the University of Cambridge and a doctoral candidate in a war studies at King's College in London. Now, if there's ever a character that in every single movie you've ever seen about a dystopian future or like a world crisis where they call that person into the cabinet office or to the White House to explain to the president what's going to happen, what the options are, it sounds like this person is you. So with that, tell us, how did you end up doing this? <laughs> well, first of all, thanks so much for having me. I'm, I'm excited to be here. And man, that's some high praise. Um yeah, well, I actually fell into this from the defense and intelligence side of things. A couple of years ago, I just got very interested and started working and doing my PhD on intelligence studies and open source intelligence, more specifically, thinking about how emerging tech was going to be affecting intelligence capabilities and realizing that there really wasn't much being discussed about AI. And so ended up becoming fascinated and really diving into that area. And since then, the majority of my work has been at the intersection between defense and intelligence and AI, which has been both fascinating and frankly terrifying, um, especially thinking about some of the you know more near-term threats like the impact of generative AI and making synthetic media or deep fakes and what risks and opportunities that might have for us as a society. Yeah. And so with that background, especially with those, and it's not clear to me whether or not governments are fully aware of what's the existential risk here. Maybe if you had to calibrate, and we've all heard of the doomsday clock, if you have to calibrate based upon your background, your research, and everything that you're looking at right now, what is your doomsday mm -hmm. clock on the, the sort of awareness of these issues before we start unpacking them into greater detail? Oh, gosh, that's a good question. So honestly, I think up until probably... A year and a half ago, there was still very little awareness. I'd repeatedly have conversations with folks in government and in industry, and there was just really not a lot of knowledge or understanding of not only what technology is available and how it's being used, but what this could mean um, in terms of um, threats and looking at what that threat landscape is going to look like in the future. But with the advent of huge AI public models like ChatGPT or Stable Diffusion, DALI, I think that made such an incredible impact not just on the public, but on policymakers as well, on, on, on folks in industry in a way that conversations we were very much struggling to do just because it was so visceral and visible. And so I think that awareness has really grown and that's fantastic. And there's been a lot of focus both within the US government, the UK government on discussing and trying to understand these risks better, which is great, but I still think we still have a ways to go. This is such a huge varied landscape that it's really hard to tackle all these different things and think about sort of short-term risks and long-term risks as well. Yeah, so I, I want to come back to government and policies as the third step, but I wanted to maybe break out for the listeners, what are the areas that I think we're going to cover here? What, what I'd love to hear from you is 
First of all, let's unpack those issues. What are the national security issues that you're researching? You know, I love what the CSIC says they deal with, which is the opportunities, but the existential risks that society has because of technologies like AI. So let's unpack that. So in your opinion, what that looks like, then let's move on to the societal impact of that, right? And how to deal with that impact. And then how, concluding with where does policy play a part in that? And what is the responsibility of businesses or, or platforms in reestablishing that trust? So it's not just on government, right? So mm -hmm. maybe that's the journey that we can walk the listeners through. But yeah. Let's start, off, let's start off with that first one. So it's ironic in some ways, and we talked about this last time, that the artwork behind you is entirely... <laughs> the artwork in my office, yes. All AI generated. Including mm -hmm. the one of what looks like Sir Thomas More or whatever uh, on the... On oh, the yes. Map. So, yes. Um, so just to, to give some context to the listeners. So sort of the, my main focus at the moment in terms of different types of AI risk has been looking specifically at the synthetic media threat landscape. And so synthetic media really refers to any digital media that has been produced or manipulated by AI. So that's images, audio, video, audio, visual. Some people include text. I do. Others don't. And that is just one, unfortunately, of many potential risks. But it's one that we're seeing increasingly becoming an issue. You know, at the time of us recording, news just released a couple of days ago about some Taylor Swift deep fake revenge porn, which is horrendous. But that's just one of many examples of, of how this tech is being used maliciously and being weaponized. There are very fun, beneficial, innocuous uses as well. Case in point, um, the art, I, like, I have quite a bit of AI generated artwork and the piece that Carlos is referring to is called The Last Rembrandt. And this was a piece that was made between Microsoft and I think the National Dutch Museum of Art, where they took all of the Rembrandts they had already and ingested them into training a generative AI model to spit out what they thought would be like a perfectly statistically average Rembrandt. And it's incredible. You take a look at it and I would immediately guess it's a Rembrandt. I would have no idea that it was created by AI. It's incredibly detailed. I encourage everyone to go Google it because it's quite cool. And so there's some very awesome uses for this technology as well. It's not all bad. Unfortunately, though, the bad can be incredibly risky. And so that's what I tend to look at day to day. Yeah. And so let, let's go deeper into that one. There's two vectors that we can go down. One of them is, let's say, societal security. I don't know if there's a more elegant way of saying that. Another one is uh, more of like defense security, which generally would fall into this idea of national security, but I just want to mm -hmm. separate those two. They're both underpinned by trust issues, right? If you have lack of trust, they're fundamentally different. But societal issues are where, in my opinion, this is where I would love to hear your thoughts, or maybe there's better, more precise language for this. Societal issues is where, you know, the media I consume is no longer reliable for, for me to make opinions, whether that's artwork or whether that's social media or anything like that. On the other one, which I call defense trust issues, it's where you can't trust OSINT anymore. You can't trust the technical data, the technical data, which is different than entertainment data, the stuff you're relying on, drone imagery, modified images, or like the stuff that you're relying on as a fundamental decision maker for for a lot of your defense policy is not functional. And so maybe you can walk us through to what level we are on both, maybe what the words are, if you have better words than, than the ones I've chosen, but where are we on those two spectrums? Yeah, yeah, that's, and I think you've encapsulated a really interesting difference in categories that is worth thinking through. Although I would say that the, you know, the underlying threat to both is, is the same technology, it's the same, can be the same products and services. And it's sort of, what are those information environments look like? You know, they're a little different for someone like you and me on the ground as a digital consumer versus someone, you know, an intelligence, you know, agent in um, the CIA and like the other sources of information they might have access to, which could help make it easier or harder to figure out what's going on. But overall, so we at CSIS, we completed recently a, or conducted, I guess, a, an experimental survey to try to figure out how we reach this inflection point of can people tell what is real or fake anymore? Can we rely on our own eyes and ears to distinguish between synthetic and authentic media? Because at the moment, that's the only reliable defense we have. There are discussions on technical solutions. There's been discussions on how you change online infrastructure and online platforms. But at the moment, it's pretty much on us, the observer, to figure it out. 
Unfortunately, in this study where we were looking at audio, video, images of people, landscapes, food, we did, it was a very, very study with around 1300 participants from the ages of 18 to 85. So a very large demographic. Unfortunately, the average detection accuracy rate was 51.2%, which is pretty much the same as flipping a coin. So in digging into that further and looking at some of the more granular results really showed us and really reinforced the realization that people cannot tell the difference and you don't need perfect tech to have that. We were using only publicly available products and services, whether that was open source or commercial, to generate or to source these media items for the survey. They were not particularly cutting edge. They weren't exclusive to only a select few. And yet they're still incredibly convincing. And so that's a problem both for society, kind of broadly societal risks, as well as in the defense space. And I think, yeah, it was really clear to us we've reached this inflection point, which implies a lot about how we're going to be able to move forward and address these kinds of risks. So playing a little bit with the next segment that I'd like to go into, but maybe still not playing with the defense side of things a little bit more. The distinction between societal, what I call the societal trust issue is that it starts with a premise that it's entertainment or informative, but that is less critical hard data in some cases, like whereas open source intelligence for critical decision making is what I would call hard data, like structured data, right? And generally, I can screw with both. And so I'm trying to understand what the impact that we have. I don't know how much we are on that spectrum. We already know that society is now, based upon your study, at the point where 50% can't tell the difference between journalism and stuff for entertainment and, and media related purposes. But I cannot tell for the kinds of things that are critical, mission critical, whether it be an oil and gas or anything, how much that's permeated in. Are we at the point where actually even those industries that require hard data are at risk or have vectors of, of injection that are actually causing more problems there than, than expected? And that's a great question. And I would agree. I would say the societal impact in some ways is more nebulous. You're going to have positive uses of deep fakes. We're going to have negative uses. And we've agreed, you know, we, uh, with our study, we found people can't tell the difference. And that's going to degrade trust more broadly, depending on what we're seeing, who, what institutions we already trust, you know, what information brokers, digital consumers trust. But that's also because they only really get you know, whatever the, the information is publicly available. Whereas with the defense side of things, you know, ideally you're going to have access to other sources of information. One, you know, two, you're going to have as ideally kind of a lot of contextual knowledge and understanding of what you're looking for, looking for very discrete pieces of intelligence, which can at the moment still be harder to fake because, you know, you would need things that are very specific to that, where you can be a little more flexible with deep fakes for, societal entertainment or just, for example, revenge porn. So like sort of the requirements and the stringency for, I would say, OSINT sort of being used for intelligence purposes is higher. And so I think it's still harder to completely trick people in that kind of dimension, especially if they have other access to other types of intelligence. But, you know, theoretically speaking, if we don't get a handle on this and we don't think through how are we going to counter the proliferation of weaponized deep fakes, or weaponized synthetic media, that could change, you know, as it becomes easier to fake any type of media in any way we want, that will become much more difficult to counter. Yeah. So if, if I take this question to the extreme geek level, for those of you that maybe are, are new to this, there's three forms of intelligence gathering, right? There's human intelligence gatherers, there is SIGINT, which is signals intelligence gathering, which is electronic signals that are captured from you know, foreign targets. And then there's open source intelligence gathering, which is where you would have what's available, generally speaking. And I guess the, the sort of geek level version of the question is, have we reached the point where OSINT is, or open source intelligence gathering is now irrelevant because it, it is no longer, it's 50% trustworthy and we're no longer at the, cap the, the, the point where it's a useful tool anymore without relying heavily on human intelligence and signals intelligence to, to verify it and qualify it. I think it's become, I don't think it's fully useless. I think it's become a lot harder at, the, at this point, depending on when you dig into OSINT, um, what sources you're using. So if you're basing everything off, if you're doing just Sockman, which is um, a type of open source intelligence called social media um, intelligence, and you're just pulling from social media sources, I think it's much, much harder um, for sure. If you're purely using geospatial satellite imagery and you're getting those images from trusted satellites, 
at the moment, that's still incredibly hard to fake. And so that's still very reliable. Um, if you're using a combination, obviously, then you need to start weighing what is more trustworthy, what is more secure. And so that can make things overall more tricky if you use multiple sources, but it really depends on the, the context of the type of OSINT you're gonna be using. And so I, overall though, I would definitely say it's getting much harder and less reliable than it used to be even two years ago. Yeah. Okay, well, a lot of the listeners will be familiar with the state of the world as you described it. And, and to some extent, it's a catch up for anybody else who, who's new to the subject. But now I want to jump into some of the research that you're doing and, and how to solve it, because that's that's really, that's part of the problem. It's like, we're all kind of complacent because we love playing with these things. But every time we play with it, we're just perpetuating the problem, right? Uh, whether it's creation of art, creation of music, uh, whether it's creative use of chat GPT for like essays, which then, you know, reduce the trustworthiness of a candidate for whatever it is that they're applying for. And so... What are the solutions that you're coming up with, both you know, societally or for hard data, structured, unstructured data, or whichever way you want to qualify it? Yeah. So unfortunately, there's no silver bullet here, which is really tricky. And it's going to be incredibly challenging to counter effectively. Before we even get into it, I think it's important to think about what does success look like here? And I just don't think 100% success is possible. We're never going to get to a point unless we radically change how our society is structured and how the internet is structured to make sure that no weaponized synthetic media slips by people, right? That's just, you're always gonna have actors who have incredible amounts of resources, of key intelligence, of um, different venues of attack or vectors of attack to do this. And so realistically, if we are able to, let's say, eliminate 80% of weaponized synthetic media, I think that's gonna be as good as it gets. Thinking more about people, you know, the bad actors who have less research or more constrained, can't use quite as good technology, can be stopped more easily in different ways. That's what we really need to focus on. But the response is going to have to be society-wide. It's going to need to include government response. It's going to need to include industry, academia, civil society, and even digital consumers themselves, which is part of what makes it so tricky because that's a lot of moving parts and that's spreading responsibility throughout a number of stakeholders, which as anyone who's worked in a group project always makes things more difficult. <laughs> But I guess we can drill down into sort of what we've identified as four of the highest priority policy objectives and which we think need to be um, focused on now, not only because they are going to be some of the most impactful responses we can have, but they're going to create necessary foundations for future policies. Because we also have to remember that there's other types of technology coming into play. You know, society is constantly changing, our digital environment's changing, and so we need to think long term as well about how do we deal with this and also how do we make sure that we don't start constraining things to the point where we actually harm free speech or the ability to be creative or small businesses. And so it's a delicate balance. But just to, to briefly list the four highest priority uh, policy objectives, the first is to establish a comprehensive generative AI uh, content governance infrastructure throughout the whole AI value chain. We also need to increase funding and research into digital media authentication technology, um, building a robust labeling standards for uh, generative AI content online is also critical. And last but not least, we need to think more about how do we do comprehensive digital media education? And then also how do we install supporting infrastructure online to help reinforce and strengthen that education? And so you can see just off the bat, there's a lot of different things to do. And that would require participation from a number of different stakeholders yeah. across the board. Well, the third part of, of our chat is around those stakeholders. But let's pause that for a second and just go into the depths of those policy objectives, because some of them are actually technological requests. It's like labeling standards. I mean, that's an ever-evolving taxonomy. How do you ever come to a conclusion there, right? Because we don't even know what kind of data we're going to be creating a decade from now. Like we didn't expect a decade ago that we'd be generating certain kinds of data. So how does an organization like the ones that you represent, how, how do they think about even approaching this problem? Because some of the underlying technologies, like for example, hashes for validating an authenticity of something have existed for years, you know, or sort of some version of public key cryptography for showcasing and validating something that's existed for years. 
But what I cannot understand is when I hear these four policy objectives, how it is that that is applied in an ever-changing, fast-paced world, and when the cat's already out of the bag, this protocol's already out the bag, how do you retrofit that? So I know it's a big one, but- Good question though. <laughs> Um, yeah, so we can definitely delve into it. So thinking about what robust labeling standards would look like and how do they work long term. If you're familiar at all with some of the technical measures being looked at for detecting synthetic media, you'll know that at the moment, the technology is still pretty brittle and narrow and it breaks easily. It can be tricked fairly easily. It's not fantastic. However, it's worth keeping in mind that the funding for this area has been absolutely minimal. You think of the billions of dollars currently being put into the creation of generative AI to create more data versus the very limited funding being put in to detect that kind of data. If you can imagine just even a touch more of that would probably make some substantial tech differences in identifying kind of new techniques and directions that kind of research could take. But thinking overall for how would we implement this, we need to really think about, well, what is the point of this? Like, what's the ultimate goal? What are we trying to do with labeling standards? How does the overlying infrastructure look? And as your, to your point, how can we leverage existing measures out there? We don't have to start from scratch. And so, so the things that we've been focusing on, one, are um, thinking about how do you make this multi-layered, right? And so feasibly, you know, well, there's a lot of focus on going, oh, we'll just put a watermark on it, like on the image, and that shows that it, it's an AI deepfake, which is great until someone crops that and reshares it on a different platform. You know, so how do we also have another layer under there to cryptographically watermark it? So even if observers can't tell, an online platform would be able to scan it and say, oh, we know that this has been labeled as AI generated and can put a label back on. So you want something for the consumers, you want something for the platforms and, and the, the technology measures they're using. We wanted to make it robust. So when we have this kind of cross-platform migration or you have people who are trying to get around it to make it much more difficult for them to remove this, so that you need that supportive online infrastructure. Coming back to hashes, for example, you could think through how, for example, someone creates AI-generated content natively on TikTok, which is possible, that TikTok could put a hash on that and use that in a shared database with other online platforms, which there are currently um, various fingerprinting databases used, being used for other purposes that multiple platforms have um, access to. So that capability exists. So that if that gets reshared on Instagram or in Facebook, that Instagram and Facebook can then access that database and go, oh, well, we found that hash. We know this is a deep fake. Someone hasn't labeled this correctly. We'll fix that. You know, um, so the tech is there and it can be used, but it's going to be more than just about putting a stamp on an image or thinking about how do you label an audio? It's going to be thinking through more. How do we rely on the existing infrastructure online and build it further to make this all more robust. And yeah. as you said, how do we do this long-term when things start to change? How do we respond? I mean, the good thing is it sounds like the four policy objectives capture what intuitively I think would solve the problem. And as we established, a lot of the technologies already exist that would create a structure that would help people validate. And you already mentioned one of the policy objectives of education. So presuming that people are educated and want to look out for, that's great, right? So now you have the tools, you have that. But what I cannot tell from these four policy objectives, and maybe because you're part of conversations that I'm not, is how much the parties that are required to do this are already in conversations or willing to converse on this. Because part of what I see the problem is here is that unlike, let's say, a new hardware standard, this is already out of the bag for decades. It's not like, oh, let's launch Bluetooth as a coalition and then let's all agree on what Bluetooth looks like or some other ISO standard. This cat's already out of the bag. And look how long it took for Apple to adopt USB-C. You know, it took decades. And so realistically, what is the outcome for this? I agree. You've pinpointed what I think is the biggest issue by far is not just what are the solutions, but it's how do we get these solutions to be adopted widely enough to make them effective, you know, because it is going to take work, it's going to take money, it's going to take resources and coordination, and it's not going to be easy. And so there, in some ways, there's limited incentive to actually engage in this unless you're getting really pushed to do it, which is why we talk about in our report, what kind of legislation would also be useful to help engage with that further. But no, I think that's going to be a huge problem. And in terms of how the actual engagement is so far, 
So in the U.S., there was a White House executive order back in the end of 2023 that discussed um, voluntary commitments with large um, AI companies and how they would want to get more involved or would agree to get more involved in things like developing guardrails when this content is being generated. So thinking through comprehensive generative AI content governance infrastructure, discussing labeling content as well, but these were all voluntary commitments. None of these are required. And so that can be very difficult. Also, when you think about the industry and how diverse it is, how do you make these kind of requirements for very large companies versus small companies without being worried about monopolies being created because small companies just can't adhere to these standards. And that's something that was discussed a lot in the um, the EU AI Act. And how do we balance between that? Because obviously that's a huge concern here. But in terms of actually, let's say, applying machine detection, that industry is still incredibly small. And there are some groups in the market who are trying to create this technology. But again, it's brittle, it's narrow, it's very easy to circumnavigate. Very few people are really applying it. And frankly, if it's not really working, I can understand why. We had, uh, so the EU required, as of August of last year, all major online social media companies to start comprehensively labeling their deep fakes. And I don't know about you, but from looking at how this is going on in these, a lot of these social media platforms, that's not really happening. There's been some creating some ability for people to self-label that doesn't really get enforced. It's not very clear, you know, it's not happening. And so at the moment, as it stands, we're seeing limited movement towards actually engaging in some of these types of policies, which obviously makes things incredibly hard. And that is one of the chief issues um, in trying to respond is not just what do we do, but how do we get people to actually do it? Which brings up a point. You mentioned four policy objectives. Now I was going to ask whether there is a, a fifth one that's missing or whether it's encompassed in one of the four, which is what does representation look like to achieve this? Is it, is it representation at the individual organizational level? Is there a new body that needs to be created that represents certain industries and on those industries can enforce it? What does representation need to look like? Because the one that you mentioned, digital media education infrastructure, a lot of that stuff is for the beneficiaries of this. Mm -hmm. But the fifth one could be a form of structured governance that spreads throughout different organizations or a new form of role that is required, similar to a chief compliance officer within a company whose job it is to do. That. And I'm trying to understand what is the recommendation there? Is there a fifth one here or is it representation? Yeah, I would, I would say it's sort of embedded in all of these, but it's a good point to bring up. We're dealing with a problem which wall is not brand new, just the extent of the issue and the risk is significant enough that it is worth thinking through how do we develop, you know, standards organizations around this and develop the expertise. And so we are seeing that happen to some degree. So in the U.S., for example, the Partnership on AI has been developing standards and how do we address synthetic media to provide advice to companies of what kind of expertise they need, what should they be doing. NIST, um, which is a government entity and the U.S. government entity is working a lot on this as well um, and trying to do the same thing uh, in the U.K. Here, we're also seeing different government um, regulatory bodies work on this throughout different industries and with the idea of liaising with the AI Safety Institute, I believe it's called, to think about more robustly how does this work overall. So there are a lot of different organizations out there or moves being made towards trying to help develop guidance around this. And that's definitely embedded in, in some of the recommendations we have for how do we accomplish these different policy responses. But I agree that is a critical next step for engaging and trying to accomplish these different objectives. Yeah. So it sounds like it's still very much nascent. The whole, yes, the whole solution very much so. is very much nascent, which is actually kind of scary a little bit. It's a little bit, especially when you see, you know, you're thinking about how the U.S. elections are coming up this year. The U.K. elections are probably going to be this year. We've already seen instances of election interference last year with people using alleged deep fakes, and that's just likely to grow. We've been seeing, you know, deep fakes being used in the Ukraine conflict. We're starting to see it being used in other really malicious areas. And so it, the threat landscape is changing rapidly, but we don't really have a way to respond to it at the moment. So. We covered a little bit about some of the initiatives and different parties involved uh, to try to solve this problem. And I, I want to go into a little bit more the, the less obvious 
members of society from a commercial point of view that contribute to this. So what should the responsibility be and, and who in reestablishing societal trust? So what I mean by the non-traditional actors is obviously we can all say TikTok should or Facebook should or Google should, right? So yeah, fair enough. Okay, we can discuss that. But how about the broader tech community or how about the family unit or schools or mm -hmm, the, mm -hmm. the, the DVLA slash DMV who gives you a driver's license? Like walk us through what you think the world needs to look like from a responsibility ownership to reestablish that trust. Is, is there something yeah. that's unusual here that think needs to happen? Yeah, and, and to be fair, I do think this trust degradation is definitely wider than AI. We've already been seeing it happening pre deep fakes. You know, we saw this with the 2016 US elections, you know, a rapid decrease in, in trust and in institutional trust of, you know, trusting kind of mainstream media, trusting what the government's saying, um, and that's continued. And I think synthetic media really accelerates that for sure, but it is a broader underlying societal problem. Um, but what we could do specifically in relation to trying to establish trust around weaponized synthetic media and how do we get people to trust what they see or know how to think through more critically when they consume content and all of that, I think it's going to be, again, a multi-tiered issue. So we definitely need to start to see more digital media education in schools, not just a one-off thing, but seeing that repeatedly happen as the technology continues to rapidly change. So kids are aware of what's out there. We need to see adults doing this too. And this is where, for example, companies could come in and make a really big difference by teaching their employees what these threats are and what's out there and how they can protect themselves, both from a employee standpoint, if they get targeted because they work for that company and also just as a digital consumer, what they can do. I think that's going to be huge in terms of how else can we build trust? Well, we need to start thinking through and trying to use technical measures and something that a lot of companies, especially those who are involved in the creation of synthetic media, need to think through what can they do? And so the phrase I would use is take care of your own backyard. Sure, you might not be able to solve all the society's problems yourself, but what could you do to make yourself a more trusted provider? And could that be, for example, if you create, if you're part of creating like synthetic images, is there a way that you can degrade the image to the point where while we as humans can't observe a difference, a machine can much more easily tell that it's been generated by AI, the same with audio or video. You know, so while the consumers don't see a difference, it is just much easier to detect and pick up. And what could we do there to make that possible? Can you create a service where people could submit images to you and you could check that against the database you have? Like, how do you make it harder for people to create illegal content? Or if they do, how do you find them? How do you verify their identities? And that sort of, again, it's not solving all of society's problems, but if a lot of companies did that and that got scaled up, that would make a significant difference, not just in setting standards, but in just making it harder for people who are trying to maliciously employ synthetic media to do so. The barriers will just be higher. So that is definitely, if we're thinking, not so outside the box, but not thinking beyond the big players, like the big sort of online platforms and government, there are a lot of things and smaller little things that can be done here to just make it more difficult for people to create illegal and malicious content. Yeah, I mean, I think it brings up a um, very existential question, and a broader question, rather, with um, the tools that we have now, being able to generate stuff that is very much possibly wrong in some uses and unethical or commercially not approved in, in other instances. Education is not just identification of that, but also education involves potentially having to help people discern where their action, empowered by AI, is either on the right end of the spectrum or on the wrong end of the spectrum. But the problem then becomes, well, who defines that right or wrong spectrum? And mm -hmm. you think that the, the power that AI has in creating and augmenting the right and wrong is going to force our society to revisit a more studied form of ethics and or revisiting some of the renaissance type explosion of, of character development and, and sort of exploration into ethics in order for us to reconcile these broken trust circles. Yeah, I would agree because it used to be that 
you know, both so, let's say pre, pre-social media. Most people were just a voice shouting into the void. Their opinions only got so far for better or worse. And so regardless of just general moral responsibility, there's only so much impact you had. And that starts to change with social, the advent of social media and just how far you could go and how much you could influence others. And now, again, with the uptick in the creation of this generative AI technology, which makes it easier to create things that are fake, which but could be real, I would agree. With great power comes great responsibility. And there's a lot of power being put it back into the hands of the everyday people, which is in some ways fantastic and democratizing in a really wonderful way, but also means that people can do bad things. And even if they're not think- necessarily thinking through why this might be bad or why this might be really, really harmful and education of that is going around that is going to be key, especially when you think about kids who can get this kind of tech easily online and might not really think through how this could be harmful. One incident um, from 2022, I believe, or early 2023, was there were some, I think it was a middle school or high school kids, created for fun a deep fake of their principal, saying some horrible racial slurs and hate speech, and that went viral. And they figured out it was a deep fake, obviously, and kids got in trouble and got found. But you can think about how, had there been some sort of education module, not just on how this technology is possible, but sort of your personal responsibility around this, maybe they would have realized the negative impact that would have had and have decided not to do it. But I agree. I think with this is going to create a very different societal dynamic that we also need to be able to reconcile and figure out how to approach. Yeah. And if I had to paraphrase what you said, basically AI is augmenting and highlighting the ethical and societal faults we have. And that's perhaps where we need to start in trying to fix it. Yeah, frankly, if you were able to do that, I don't know if that's an easier, difficult, more difficult problem, because if you could do that, that would help substantially with reducing the volume of synthetic media being used for malicious purposes. Like that is the root of the problem, but man, good luck. Good luck. <laughs> that's, good luck. That's, All that's, right. that's a problem for smarter people than me to try to figure out. All right. Well, to, to conclude, I have four fast, fun questions for you. Love it. Well, fun is is probably uh, the wrong wrong word, but at least that they're fast. So what's the most disturbing real life manifestation of everything we've spoken about today that you've seen in the last six months? Wow. So I've not seen it, thank goodness, but I would say the most disturbing manifestation is in the last six months, a child sexual abuse material, like AI generating ring was uncovered where a prolific amount of images of children were created in horrible contexts. And the report, I think the folks who did this, and I the Internet Watch Foundation uncovered this, and that's just horrific. I think with the most vulnerable members of our society, and not only, yes, you could argue that, sure, these are all AI-generated, but one of the big concerns and side effects that they found is this is making it harder to actually identify real victims because... You just see all this content online, you can't tell the difference. And so for me, that just encapsulates the most horrific use of this type of technology and how it's just, you can just, I mean, the damage is just so clear there. And so for me, that's, yeah, I would say that's the worst. I've not seen, but I have heard about and hope to not hear much more about. (laughs) And um, for this next one, you're not allowed to use an example of policy but it's the flip to that question, which is the, what's the most hope creating manifestation of our chat today? But you're not allowed to say, well, this policy document that has 12 points. Uh, it has to be. <laughs> <laughs> oh man. So you mean that the most hopeful use of AI, the most hopeful response towards yeah, hopeful, regulating AI? Hope creating the fact that we're not screwed. We're not heading down a dark path that right. you've seen the last six months of, well, actually this is actually a, I, okay, so well, one incredible use I've been seeing is the use of AI to help augment for disabilities. And so there's a company called Respeecher, and what they've been doing is they are an audio deepfake company. And they part of their work is to help people who can no longer speak, whether that's due to an accident or injury or to medical condition um, like throat cancer, to be able to communicate again, you know, and to do so in a very realistic and to emote in ways that, you know, if you think about sort of earlier technology, like what Stephen Stephen Hawking had, just was really difficult. And so to see people using technology like that 
and think about how you could also use this kind of technology to help blind people more easily navigate the world around them. And these are just two of many examples. So I think that's an incredible use of this tech that I'm really yeah. excited to see more of. That is a good example. All right. What's a good day for you look like and what's a bad day for you look like? Oh, man. Um, great question. Uh, I would say a good day is when I have discussions with folks either in industry or in government or across the think tank space are also looking at this and acknowledging it's an issue and are trying to also work on this because there are a lot of different people throughout these spaces who are equally concerned or trying to do work on this are you know trying to help solve this issue and so whenever I see that that is just really heartening um, and it makes you feel like you're part of a larger community um, trying to get involved and as we've said we need a very extensive community to do this and so that's always great to see because I've been working on this stuff for gosh years now and for a long time it felt like shouting into the void um, because people weren't interested or they didn't understand it and so that's definitely changed and so when I get to see that day to day that's fantastic. I would say a bad day would be hearkening back to what I mentioned earlier when you just see another horrific use of this technology being used and that's just depressing you know and you feel like this is why we can't have nice things come on guys get your act together when I find it just particularly horrific weaponization of this tech you know it really does put a dampener on sort of your outlook and can we actually do anything about this if this is as you said this cat's out of the bag and it's already been used in this way so that's what I would say in 10 years what job do you think you'll be doing <laughs> and which job do you think will have disappeared by then? Ooh, oh, that's a great one. Um, 10 years will depend on, on what direction AI takes. I might still be researching and doing work in this space, which would be incredible. Um, but it really depends on what the environment looks like then. But I think we'll always have need for researchers looking at these kinds of issues. Maybe we'll be doing AI, maybe we'll be doing quantum, who knows? And the jobs that I think will disappear. Ooh, that's a tricky question. Um, I think actually what we'll see is less full jobs disappearing and more of the kind of more basic aspects of these jobs disappearing. And people will be then expected to, instead of doing kind of more busy work, be doing things that are just more comprehensive, more robust. Again, things that AI probably still can't do yet, you know, so instead of someone creating like a simple logo as a designer, they might be asked to be more engaged with either creating something more complex or a broader part of the campaign and the design campaign for like a brand logo and brand marketing or something like that. So, uh, yeah, I feel like we'll less see full, you know, entire fields completely disappear and more of what people are required to do in those fields become more comprehensive. All right, last question. What do you think the title of the book you'll write when you retire will be? When I retire will be, oh gosh, I don't know. That is a great question. Um, I have not even thought about that. So what would you think it would be? I don't think I have an answer for that actually. You mean my book? Yeah. Well, I mean, I've, I've written a book called Fundraising Field Guide. This is a cheap plug for it. Hey guys, you know, download it if you haven't done so. And I'm probably on version 10 by then, who knows? Um, Fantastic. On a somewhat more serious note, I think at least from my point of view as an investor, I hope that I'm changing people's lives through the investments we make and, you know, the impact that has and some of the highlights and lowlights of those stories. So I think the way that I'm trending is more like uh, investment biographical, um, Ooh, but you, you have an interesting perspective, though, because yours is foundational and uh, change at the societal level. And so, you know, I'm curious how much you see a future where you were catalyst and a central catalyst for that. Um, or or oh, man. academician, you know, sort of cataloging it or or witness to it. Yes. I mean, if there was chaos anyway, I would hope that it would be a positive one um, with some of the research we've been doing to help really get people to realize we've hit this inflection point and we need to do something about it. Because I think people keep thinking it's a problem for future us, which it's a problem for us right now. Um, but in terms of witness, I yeah, something to do. I, I wouldn't have a, a, a great time at the point, but something about 
the change in access to intelligence and information, you know, because OSINT's in the last couple of years really, I would argue, minimize that intelligence gap where you've got groups like Bellingcat who can do these incredible reports to the degree that they're very influential of a lot of discrete specific intelligence points, which five years ago, 20 years ago, only intelligence agencies could do. And now if you're good and you know what to do, you yourself could do it. But then as to your point with synthetic media, that's also starting to change the game again. And is that creating a larger gap? So something about that, and I don't know what a perfect title for would be, but I feel like that would be a really interesting dynamic and one that I'll be witnessing throughout my career is that dynamic between access to intelligence and information for the common person and how does that impact them? Yeah, fair. Well, thanks so much. It's been such an amazing and fun thank chat. Thank you so much for having me. I've had a great time. Keep on we going. We keep going. I know. <laughs> There's so much more we could talk about, but maybe a part two sometime in the future there we after, go. after we've survived the, the Skynet. Um, <laughs> so if people wanted to follow you or, or get in touch, um, what's the best way? Yes. So um, I'd say a lot of my contact information is on Twitter. I don't post on Twitter, but um, I'm also on LinkedIn and I, I am on the CSIS website. So please feel free to, to get in touch. And when we publish the report that will be coming out on the CSIS website, we'll be going into a lot more detail of not just what these policy objectives are and how do we respond to them, but yeah, I guess in more detail, how does the technology community, how can they respond? What should they be doing? What does this look like in a U.S. context, in a U.K. context, potentially even an EU context? Um, so if you're interested in reading more, come and take a look at um, our reports there. Excellent. When should people be expecting that report? So that should be coming out at the latest by the end of February. So pretty soon. Uh, and we'll be producing the preprint of the study that will be coming out this week. So it's actually good, good timing that we're doing this. But if you want to look at all like the hard numbers of how good people are at um, distinguishing the real from the fake, that, the, that preprint, which we'll be sharing, will be out this week. Excellent. All right. Well, with that, guys, thanks so much for joining. Thank uh, you so much for having me.